Welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm Bill Plant. We have a special edition of Washington Unplugged for you today from the White House briefing room as the president and the press corps prepare to set off on the trip to Asia. And with me today to talk about that, the Wall Street Journal's Jonathan Wiseman. Hey, Bill. Jonathan, the president's been so deeply involved in Afghanistan and health care that what he's going to do in Asia is pretty much off the radar. It's really, this trip has really kind of snuck up on him, but actually there are a lot of issues on the table. You know, in Japan, there's a new government of Prime Minister Hatayama has campaigned saying that he wants Japan to have more equal footing with the United States, especially with those military bases in Okinawa, which are not particularly popular. He's going to this uh, APEC conference in Singapore where for the first time a United States uh, a president is going to be sitting down with the whole group, including the Burmese government, the Burmese junta. He goes on to China, which has become the great bankers of the United States to see if they'll keep floating us. But, you know, human rights is on the agenda there. He, he decided not to meet with the Dalai Lama when he, was in the United, when he was in the United States. He says that he will bring up Tibetan human rights there. Then he goes on to, to uh, South Korea, where there's a free trade agreement still sitting on the president's desk, not moving anywhere. First on the human rights issue, he's going to be criticized for even speaking to or perhaps shaking hands with the Burmese representative when he meets the Asian leaders. Absolutely, you know this is uh, you know this is this is the test of his vow to engage our enemies as well as our friends. Nobody has talked to the Burmese junta, um, and this is the president of the United States meeting with them. But you know, one of his senior aides, Jeffrey Bader, said he doesn't want to punish the rest of Southeast A Asia just because they're trying to hold uh, Burma at bay. And it's not very sexy, really, in terms of the way news gets covered. But there's a huge issue with the economy in Asia. They suffered a lot from the global downturn. They blame the United States. Mm -hmm. And our China is our biggest rival in the area. Tell me more about that. Well, you know, the United States um, at the G20 in Pittsburgh pushed for what they're calling a rebalancing. They want China to start consuming more stuff and stop selling us so much stuff. That means that they want the Chinese to start buying some of our things instead of us buying all of theirs. And they promise that United States consumers, uh, you know, we profligate consumers will stop buying so much junk. Yeah, and maybe fat chance, saving right? Saving some. Yeah, fat chance. You, you go. He's the president is going over there, and it's hard to imagine what exactly he's going to actually do to make this happen. The one big issue is Chinese currency. If China's currency was more expensive, um, the Chinese would have more power to buy, and their goods would be more expensive in the United States. But it's hard for a Barack Obama to push the Chinese to make that happen because he needs China to keep buying billions and billions, actually now trillions of dollars in U.S. debt to keep us afloat. And he doesn't want to be seen as down on one knee begging the Chinese. No, you know, it's an embarrassing moment. This is a kind of a pas de deux here. You know, he wants to look like he is an, on equal footing with the Chinese, but when you're running a $1.4 trillion budget deficit, you need somebody to buy all those treasury bonds you're putting onto the market. And right now, China is the only one that has the deep enough pockets to do it. And let's not forget the other big issue out there, uh, two big issues. North Korea's uh, atomic weapons and Iran's. We're both going to come up in all these meetings. Certainly. I mean, China is one of the so called P5 plus one, a permanent member of the Security Council. And it's one of the big sticking points on getting tougher sanctions on Iran, also on North Korea. You know, China has always been somewhat indulgent in the North Korean regime because. It doesn't want to see North Korea collapse suddenly. It thinks that there would be a huge refugee crisis flooding into into China, and all those U.S. troops that are sitting on the on in the demilitarized de zone, militarized zone between North Korea and South Korea, Chinese think suddenly will be sitting on their border. They don't want that either. But um, you know, the United States insists that China doesn't want a, a nuclear Korea, uh, and that's what we're, we look like we're getting right now. So the other big issue hanging over this whole trip is the expected announcement shortly after the president gets back of his new policy in Afghanistan. That's right. And, you know, uh, the South Koreans just announced they were going to send a reconstruction team to Afghanistan. The Japanese, I think, are the third largest contributor in aid. 
uh, and civilian aid to, uh, to, to Afghanistan. There are a lot of issues on the table on Afghanistan. And of course, wherever the president goes, he's got three press conferences planned. You can bet he's going to get questions about Afghanistan, which is probably not what he really wants to talk about right now. There's been a lot of talk about the White House understanding that they can't make a lot of forward progress on trade and other big issues, but that they're going to try to use the president's star power to uh, make an impression in that part of the world. I mean, does this make any sense? You know, it's hard to imagine the president keeps going out and relying on star power, on speeches, on oratory, on these meetings with uh, kind of town hall meetings. He's got a town hall meeting with Shanghai youth coming up. Um, problem is that he has to eventually come home with some concrete achievement. And right now, the White House is really playing down the chances. They're saying they're, they're, it's uh, an agreement on the basis in Okinawa is not ripe. They said that uh, don't, don't expect any uh, deals to be cut on, on uh, global warming uh, when he's in China. Right. Don't expect any progress on the free trade agreement in South Korea. What we're going to get is one big speech in Japan. We're going to get the president's you know, fetting of the Chinese at a state dinner at that, uh, that um, town hall meeting in Shanghai and a big meeting with troops in, in South Korea. Um, you know, it'll be great theater, but I'm not sure if it's going to be great accomplishments. Well, of course, that's another all-time White House tactic. Every administration lowers expectations that's right. before any one of these trips. Yeah, I'm not sure what they, you know, they, <laughs> the one big thing that, that environmentalists are actually worried about is a deal on climate change in, between the two largest emitters of greenhouse gases, the United States and China. They're afraid that China is going to cut an easy deal with the United States before the big global summit in Copenhagen next month and uh, that will actually put them in bad stead you know when the when the United States um, says don't worry we're not going to cut a deal in some ways they're playing down expectations they're also trying to keep um, keep the environmentalists on board there so we'll stay tuned to see whether <clears throat> the president can beat these artificially lowered expectations yeah, it won't be hard to beat them they're really really low Bill. <laughs> Jonathan Wiseman of the Wall Street Journal thanks very much for being with us on Washington Unplugged thank you and now, we'll go to our man Fernando Suarez for a look on this Veterans Day at one of the hardest guard posts in the nation. It is an elite group of soldiers who've spent months training for what some might think is a simple guard post. But in the 51-year history of guarding the tomb of the unknown soldiers, less than 570 have earned tomb badges, and only a few hundred actually earned the right to stand watch. Despite the obvious battle with the elements, it's what takes place behind the scenes that makes this such an exclusive brotherhood. The U.S. Army has given us rare access into the daily lives of a tomb sentinel. This underground facility is located just feet away from the very tombs they help protect, an area that is not open to the public and seldom allows media access. This is where the guards are, are at when they're not outside. Exactly. Sergeant Benton wow. Timms is one of nine ranking officers in charge of changing out the guards. He has agreed to show us around on his day off, while we quickly realize that his schedule is not like most people's. Usually for that 24-hour shift, we're going to be up for that entire 24-hour shift. They work around the clock, starting their day at 5 a.m. and ending their shift at 6 or 7 the next morning. They get one day off in between shift, which sounds manageable but it's the prep work before the next shift that consumes most of their free time. Uh, this is my, my changing boss. As Each he guard tediously cares for his own uniform, everything from pressing the pleats on their jackets to measuring their metal placements to 1 64th of an inch. When I come into work that next work day, I come in here and the first thing I do is I take this blouse out, I hang it up on my locker, and I check everything again. Because maybe overnight, uh, well, you know, the material might have sagged a little bit and something might be off just slightly. And so we'll go back and we'll recheck again and again. Tim says the entire process to prepare their uniform from pressing and steaming to measuring the metals can take as long as 12 hours for a rookie and about four to eight hours for more experienced soldiers. The bulk of that time, however, is taken up by shining their shoes. So every day we go back with a boot brush, boot brush them off, and sand them down with, uh, with 2,000 grit sandpaper, make sure all the texture's out, and then we'll reshine them up, and it takes several hours. They use a similar procedure for their gun holsters and bayonet scabbards, taking this crude green-issued case and turning it into a polished piece that hangs at their side. All of the metal and badges are polished by hand. You can sit in here for hours and hours and hours on end and still not be to where it needs to be. 
Only about one in 10 trainees completes the program, making earning the Tomb Guard badge the most difficult badge to obtain in the military. Once enrolled, most serve an average of one and a half years before the demanding post and the grueling schedule become too much. Working 24-hour shifts is not for everybody. Uh, measuring everything on your uniform to 1 64th of an inch is not for everybody, you know? Shiny shoes with shoe polish, again, that's not for everybody. It's all done to meet what Tim's calls a standard of perfection. You know, to honor them, we give them our absolute best. And the best thing we can give them is perfection. Perfection, which means no guard leaves this room without being fully inspected by another soldier. An extreme regimen that on some days can mean changing in and out of their ceremonial blue uniforms up to 23 times in one shift. When you're spending six, seven, eight hours shining those shoes or pressing your blouse back there at two o'clock in the morning, you just have to stop, assess why you're doing it, you know, what they gave up. And well, hey, spending six hours on my shoes is the least I can do for these guys who gave up their identities. When night falls, the vigil continues, but the ceremonial blue uniforms are hung up. Instead, guards don standard army combat uniforms to protect the tomb when the cemetery closes. In the morning, they will reset the clock and do it all over again. Fernando Suarez, CBS News, Arlington National Cemetery. Hey, thanks as always for watching Washington Unplugged.